All right, folks. Hello and welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces in the chats. Everybody um, joining us from that previous stream. I see Wade. I see uh, Corrine, RB, Anthony Jackson, Nicholas, Stephen, uh, Yusunari. Thank you guys so much for being here um, and hanging out. My name is Voodoo Val, and I am going to be your host uh, this morning for a really epic illustration stream with my new friend, Kervin. How are you, sir? How are you doing? this morning. <laughs> I am doing great. How are you guys doing? Doing excellent. Very excited to kind of jump into um, everything that we're, we're, we got planned for today. Um, Wes is like screaming your name in the chat. Um, I don't know if you know someone named Wes or if he's just a yeah, fan of yours. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> he spelt your name with like 20 I's and he's very, very pumped about today, it seems. <laughs> seems to be my number one fan for today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Good to have those. Uh, Brittany, it's good to see you. Steve Festus Kasaboom, our friends. Welcome in. Uh, uh, Laura, Ryan, good to see all you folks. Um, but yeah, we're going to do um, a, a pretty cool illustration stream, and I'm going to pass things over to Kervin in a little bit to kind of introduce himself so he can let you folks know who he is and what he does. But before we do that, I would like to point out, number one, we do have a challenge going on right now. So uh, if you folks are interested in um, checking uh, the challenge out, you can check out the, uh, the informational tabs we have above the chat um, and get a little bit of uh, information on how you can join us and get involved with the community and our challenges. Uh, if you are over on YouTube um, and you are you're watching there and typing in that chat, I welcome you to come over to behance.net slash live because that is where uh, we are going to be reading the chat. If you have any questions for Kervin um, while we go through today's stream, that is where we will be able to see what you're, uh, what you're asking about and, and answer your questions. Um, and also, I'd like to pull up the schedule so that I can show you what we have planned uh, for the segments that come up after us. Uh, so this morning we started at 7.30 a.m. Pacific time with uh, Victoria Pavlov doing a Get Started in Photoshop segment, followed by Paul Tranny doing the Photoshop Daily Creative Challenge. Um, I'm here with Kervin, um, as I mentioned before, um, and right after us we're going to have the Illustrator Daily Creative Challenge with our good friend Julia Masalska, which I'm very excited about. Uh, we've got Brandon Gross, another friend of mine, um, who's going to be doing the Adobe XD prototyping segment at noon, followed by Peter Del Tondo with the XD Daily Creative Challenge. We got the sketch party uh, with Kathleen Martin um, uh, towards the end of the day. And then at three, we are going to have designing a virtual museum tour with Howard Pinsky um, and Bill Marino. So that should be super, super fun. I'm actually super excited about this whole virtual museum thing. What do you think, Kurt? And that sounds pretty. I mean, yeah, that sounds pretty sweet. Like, I, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> sounds pretty rad. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that is what we've got planned for today. Um, and then before we jump into the work, um, Kervin, why don't you why don't you tell everybody a little bit about you um, and the kind of work that you do, um, and uh, just for anybody who might be unfamiliar with you and your work. Sure. Uh, thanks again for that, Val. Uh, no so, problem. Uh, my name is Kervin Brousseau, and I am an artist, illustrator, and designer based in New York City. Um, I work full time at a design agency called Vault 49 uh, in the heart of Soho, uh, as well as freelance under the moniker Brousseau, my last name for seems like forever now. <laughs> um, I specialize in quite a bit of stuff, uh, but mainly in digital illustration. Um, and I tackle a variety of themes from sport to fashion. Um, now, recently, topography has made its foray into my workflow as well. Um, I've dabbled in a bit of 3D in the past, so I've kind of explored a variety of different digital mediums. Um, and if you look at my Instagram on at Perso, you'll see just like a wide range of explorers. Um, one of the more notable things, my I guess kind of claim to fame, is that I was also on the Adobe Illustrator Splash page for 2019. Nice! Um, which was a lot of fun. I don't know if, if my iPad is already being shown, but I can show you guys quickly what that is as a reference. Oh so yeah, I can it. pull that up right now. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I recognize this one. This is one of my favorites of yours. Um, and I'm sure other people um, in the in the chat also recognize it because, um, as you yeah. said, it was the splash screen. I really like this just because I always love the contrast between, like, black and white, but that orange just pops so nicely. Oh, it is you. so cool. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was kind of like... Uh kind of like a shock to know that that would actually be utilized on Illustrator. So uh, definitely gave myself a pat on the back on that, but it was like super humbling to to get all the, the accolades and the kind of the praise for, for the work over the last year. So that was fun. Yeah, well done. Well done, yeah. sir. Um, 
all right, so I guess we can jump into the work. Maybe you can kind of describe what you're going to be working on for us today. Give us a little uh, uh, a little insight into what the plan is. Yeah, sure. So for, for people who are on that may be familiar with my work already, I do a lot of photo illustration work. So um, what that means is it'll typically be some kind of a fashion uh photography. For this instance, I'm utilizing one of my own photos of my friend Lucy, who's also a colleague of mine at Vault and mm -hmm. also a very talented designer. Um, and with this photo, I'll be illustrating over it, um, utilizing vector brushes specifically, um, okay. and give you guys a bit of an insight in terms of what my workflow is. So to start, typically what I always do is I'll have like a base sketch and it's not too unlike what you would do just like on tracing paper, just laying down the foundations of the composition. Um, and so here you just have a quick little insight in terms of like a rough fashion sketch, little bomber jacket, some mm -hmm. abstract elements, some flames, and some graph like graffiti like elements along the top to kind of make it like a nice sort of editorial piece. Um, and so what you guys are going to witness today is me sort of vector or inking it. Um, with a black brush and then adding some color and a bit of shading uh, to really bring it all to life over this uh, fashion photo. Nice. I'm really excited about this. And I love that we get to see kind of like a, a base sketch of like just kind of how your your brain works, essentially, like when you go mm. to like lay down um, what you do. And, and you said like this is typically like like what you do. So this is like every time whenever you sit yeah. down to start something, this is the basic flow. Awesome. Yeah, um, very basic. Yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited to see you jump into it and, and uh, start chipping away at it. This is really cool. Um, yeah, sure. I'm also... So, yeah, so... Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I don't want to cut oh, you no, off. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, because you were talking about process, that like, this process has kind of evolved and become a bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. Usually in the very beginning, I would try to like, you know, sketch and then sketch over it again mm -hmm. to like really be specific on what my black lines would be. Mm -hmm. But lately, I've been a bit more loose and a bit more interpretive of the sketch transition from the pencil into the ink um, and kind of allowing the design flow to evolve through the process and not be so like hard locked into what the pencils are because mm -hmm. I mean it's a constantly evolving ship so to speak so yeah, um, and it also just makes my process way more efficient kind of eliminating that that middle step of refining the pencils again just diving straight into to the vector yeah it saves you a little bit of time and then do you yeah. do you also find that maybe your work um is more freeing that way when you're not kind of adhering to like a, a very hard like sought out um mm -hmm. uh, i guess like structure and blueprint to what you're doing you feel like you can you can allow it to evolve and you feel better doing your work that way absolutely because i mean a part of it especially when you're starting out it's just building confidence that's mm -hmm. where the the need of just enabling that that middle step came from it's mm -hmm. just after a while doing this for a few years now and like especially this style i'm, I'm at a point like almost like a, at a complacency where i i kind of know what i want to achieve and i know that whatever i envision in my head will come to life so mm -hmm. a lot of the work now comes from refinement and like trying to crack the composition rather than technical limitations so gotcha um so that's where that that comes from now yeah um i i myself um kind of started doing a similar thing in my own work just kind of like cutting out certain uh steps that were maybe a little unnecessary and repetitive um mm -hmm. i wonder if maybe you felt a little bit like i did when you started doing this and that is that when i had less steps and i realized that my pieces were coming together a lot faster did you feel like maybe you were missing something by accident because uh, i had that feeling like Good it's coming question. together, you know, it's coming together fast. And then I'm just like, I'm already at this point. Did I forget something? Did I leave something out? <laughs> Part of it is just being confident in the process, right? Because a lot of a lot of the times, yeah, like you'll, you'll do pieces and it'll just come together in like an hour, like yeah, two just, hours. Yep. And it's just, it just clicks. And sometimes I'll, be, I'll work on pieces for like days, two, three days, because I'm just not quite satisfied with the elements. Mm -hmm. And it's less about the amount or the quantity or if I've missed a step and rather if there's like a nice harmony of the elements on the canvas. So for example, with this piece, um, like there was an earlier iteration of it that had like, you know, different kind of anatomical pieces, mm -hmm. some some figures. Um, um, I didn't have like a type element on the top originally. And I wasn't quite satisfied because I felt like, you know, it could be a bit more refined. And, and I feel like a lot of the compositional issues can be cracked at this stage actually, before mm -hmm. going into final. Um, and yeah, so I feel like, no, I, I think I think that feeling definitely goes away the more you do it. And 
and and a lot of it is just having confidence in in the process and then on top of that you work in digital right so yes there's definitely less of a finality to to the finished product if Absolutely. you feel like you look at it like a day later and it's like ah, actually i could tweak this color or this that that's the advantage of working digital i think that's why a lot of artists gravitate towards digital these days too yeah yeah i agree 100 mm -hmm. um and if anybody in chat has any uh any questions uh for Kervin, please go ahead and, and post it in chat um let's see i'm gonna i'm gonna scroll through here um and and just see if we missed any questions and you can just do what comes naturally man yeah sure all right so i'll just i'll just get started and uh yeah feel free to ping questions over guys whenever you have um more than happy to to answer them so for those of you who aren't familiar with this app just yet it's been out for a little while now it's called adobe fresco and what's the beauty about this program is, is that it quickly applies or combines raster and vector capabilities. So as you can see here, I have this pencil sketch, which is a, a raster property, arguably, right? If you mm -hmm. were to do this on a desktop, it would be in Photoshop, not in Illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, but the beauty of this is that you have, if you look on the left, I'm clicking through, you have these raster brushes, you have a live brush, and then you have vector brushes, and it's all working within a singular interface. No longer do you have to kind of jump between two different programs. For those of you guys and, and ladies who remember the Adobe Sketch and Draw Days, mm -hmm. that was the typical process for me, where it was I would do my sketches in Adobe Sketch, and then I'd go into Draw and I'd draw out in vector um, my lines. Because I, I do like the infinite scalability of vector. That's why I typically do all my final pieces with vector brushes as opposed to, to raster, to be able to scale up and down. Gotcha. If I need to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so for here, what we're going to do now is now that I have this this basic pencil sketch, I'm ready to start vectorizing and kind of add the final details into my work. Mm -hmm. um, so how I set this up is I have my pencil sketch. And underneath that, I have my original photo, which I lower the opacity just to help increase the visibility of the pencil sketch. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm going to make a new layer. If you look on the right side here, middle right, I'm clicking on that. That creates a new layer. And now it starts off a blank layer that has if you notice on these layers directly below it, there's a symbol on the left, which indicates whether, what type of layer it is. Um, the pixelated box, which is on this layer, as you can see here, indicates that it's a raster. And the one underneath that indicates that it's a photo element that cannot be edited. And you can edit these elements by clicking on the three dots on the right, and then on the bottom it says convert to pixel layer. Now you can convert any layer you create into a pixel layer, which is quite nice. So if you want to add additional augmented abilities, masking, things of that sort, super convenient, mm -hmm. but you can't go the reverse. You can't necessarily um, live trace, so to speak, a raster element into a, a vector element just yet. Maybe they will in the future, who knows? Um, but for now, that's definitely just a one-way street when it comes to that process. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Mel is saying, is there a mo mobile version for it? Yes, this is for, um... For, well, for, I guess, mobile in that it's it's on the iPad. Um, so so it's, yes. you know, it, you, you it can is on the it. iPad. Yeah, you can take yeah. it um, on the iPad. Um, and then a lot of people were asking, um, like, please explain how to use Fresco and what is Fresco. And I think that you answered that beautifully already. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of diving into what the difference between the brushes is and how people um, uh, can use it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I also use Fresco um, a lot myself, and I'm, I'm more of a raster a raster artist, I guess. I don't know, even know if that's like a thing. Like I, I always am <laughs> no, using like, the, yeah. you know, I use raster, the raster yeah. brushes and everything. So this is going to be really cool to see you kind of dive into the brushes that I am uh, a lot less familiar with. So this is going to be really nice. Yeah, sure. What I like about the vector brushes is, and I'm going to just start drawing here so that you guys can witness uh, some of the process, mm -hmm. is um, you can still capture similar fidelities as you would if you were to work with a raster brush. What I mean by that, for example, um, you know, different types of shading techniques that might be a bit more hard line, but you can have that same layer of detailing. Um, it just it just depends on the craft that you go for. So mm -hmm. I'm going to start by fleshing out this jacket. So I have this jacket here. I'm going to lower the opacity if you go on the upper right of this sketch layer too, just to help with the visibility of the black lines. Mm -hmm. And when I start to draw, so now I start my line work. And if you look on the right, you see now there's a different symbol. That indicates that it's a vector layer as opposed to a raster layer. And though gotcha. that's just like a nice way to kind of distinct between, have a mm -hmm. distinction between those two workflows. Um, you, uh, besides that, you can also control like the smoothing as you would with any other program. So. If I want to increase the smoothing a little bit, that'll just make my lines feel a bit more steady and less shaky, um, which I like to do. So 
I'm going to start setting this up. And right now, I'm not too concerned about being 100% perfect with my lines right now because, mm -hmm. again, the advantage of working digital is I could always go back and refine with Absolutely. minimal consequence. Yeah. And it's really interesting to me personally, just as somebody that doesn't work in vector constantly. Um, mm. And obviously I have in the past, but um, I think Fresco has really kind of transformed my idea of um, vectorized art, just because when I think of it mm -hmm. in my head, I usually think like creating shapes and, and all that kind of stuff. But then like here, you're, you're doing it in a way that kind of computes in my mind um, and mm -hmm. kind of opens the possibility of me. Like if I want to, if I decide I want to make vector art um, or vector, a vectorized piece, like I can really get in here and kind of do a similar workflow to just how I already work. Um, and exactly. it's, and it's still um, going to be that way. So it's awesome. Yeah, there, there's definitely, especially for me, there was a misconception in terms of vector art versus raster art, especially when I started using Adobe products back in the day. I, mm -hmm. I did not want to touch Illustrator. It, mm -hmm. it was kind of like this foreign thing that just didn't really make much sense. So I was a Photoshop heavy guy all through like most of my college mm -hmm. uh, career. And I adopted Illustrator because I started to have a better understanding of what it means to work in vector. And I, I did like that idea of not having to sacrifice any form of, of scalability, right? Nice, so, yeah. um, and that's where like maybe um, over the last 10 years, I've really, really started to embed the, 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 the vector workflow as a part of my main process. And now Photoshop kind of becomes more of a finisher. So mm -hmm. if I do things like, um, uh, like adding textures, noise, um, chromatic aberration to kind of make it feel aged or old or a bit retro. Mm -hmm. All that stuff still happens in Photoshop. Nice. Um, but all the sort of design, the the the, um, the the sort of development of the artwork, the building of those layers, mm -hmm. primarily happen in Vector or in Fresco. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people are asking um, about the specs of your device here. What do you know? Which which iPad um, uh, you are working on at the moment? That is a great question. So the iPad I'm working on, I think it's generation, I think it's the third generation because how does it go? The most recent iPad is considered generation one, right? I, I honestly, think that's how it goes. I'm not sure about that one actually. Pretty sure. So I'll break it like this. I, I have two iPads. Mm -hmm. The one I'm working on now is the older version. Like I think it came out maybe in 20, I want to say 2016. Mm -hmm. So that generation iPad I'm using because it's a, a wider, a larger screen, it's about 12 point, 12.5, I think. It sounds like we have I the same think, one. Yeah, yeah. 12.5. It's also um, like we work with the same one. Exactly, yeah. So I just like the larger screen. But the smaller one I have, the most recent iteration mm -hmm. of the iPad, with the where like the, the pencil, the magic pencil kind of clicks. Oh, yeah, it rests on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a smaller version of that, and I usually use that on like trips. And like if I want to travel, it's just more portable. Gotcha. Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, mine, mine, it's it, I got mine and it was kind of like the oldest one that you could have and still have it be compatible with the Apple pencil. Um, mm -hmm. cause when I got it, I got it actually, I got it specifically for digital art. Um, and I thought to myself, well, I'm going to, I'm not going to get the brand new one. I'm going to get the older one and I'm going to get it just to see, like, I want to test it and we'll see if this becomes like a workflow thing for me. And that was mm -hmm. like what was convenient. And, um, yeah, it ended up being like more than 50% of my workflow now is just using my, using my iPad. So I, I had no idea how integral this thing would become. Mm -hmm. like, I, I, I kind of, I got it and I was a bit skeptical in terms of, cause you know, when you're, when you're in your workflow, like you don't really, you rarely hunt for a reason to kind of disrupt it, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to art, right? Like, yeah. so, you know, your, your traditional painters will have their brushes that they love to use or have their specific paints that they'll like to use. Um, comic book artists will have their Copic pens that they like to use. We have our digital uh, workflows as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to disrupt that. It's rarely out of, out of necessity that we need to do that. It's more out of like a curiosity, I mm -hmm. feel like, especially when you are hired or approached by uh, clients, for example, for a specific style, right? Yeah. It's like, why would I disrupt that for any reason? And, and I, I've discovered that it always helps to kind of inject a few more new uh, practices over the years because it just helps evolve the process. And I think it helps evolve your work too, just mm -hmm. to, just to have like new ways of thinking, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. 
Um, let's see. A lot of people are talking about they use a, a Microsoft Surface and stuff. I, I've used oh. a Surface myself. I don't know if you've ever tried the, the Microsoft Surface. Funnily enough, my fiance, who works for Microsoft, has mm -hmm. a Surface. Um, gotcha. It, it's a very powerful, it is a very powerful piece of hardware for sure. I've mm -hmm. never had the opportunity to work off it though. But mm -hmm. I do know that they had like full Photoshop on there for a yeah. while. Yeah. Um, I, I had yeah. a Surface for, for a time um, and I did use the full version of Photoshop um, on it. I did end up, like I said, just getting... Um, uh, fresco and kind of converting to just working on the iPad. Um, mostly I think because, and it, it, and it could also be attributed to just like the, the version, um, and the, the one that I actually got, but I found that I was working on such large files that it was better for me to do those large files just in, on my desktop, um, mm -hmm. with it. And then Fresco is easier because every time I draw something, it just pops up in my creative cloud files. And if I need to transfer, um, then I can transfer that way. So it's just a better workflow for me for the iPad. But, um, I do know a lot of artists where the surface is like their main thing. Like I believe, um, Shauna Lynn, um, one of our friends that we have on, uh, to do awesome, like hand lettering and stuff. She uses a surface, I think almost every time she does the stream, um, mm -hmm. for us. And it seems like it's, um, a really great option. Um, if you folks are, are looking for, for multiple options to explore when it comes to, um, I guess like, mo I think of iPad as like mobile device. I think sometimes right. when people say mobile, they mean specifically like on your phone. Um, so I want to yeah. clarify that just like if I yeah. say mobile, I'm really, I'm really talking about tablets. Um, but I think it's a great, uh, both of them are great avenues. I mean, it's kind of crazy how much more powerful they are now. Like a oh, lot yeah. of people are using tablets in lieu of laptops because mm -hmm. they're much lighter and they're still able to do the work that they need to do at the end of the day. Yes. Um, yeah. Like, so for myself, if I, if I have like an emergency update that I need to do, that's one of the main reasons why I like working out of Fresco mm -hmm. um, primarily first before I finish stuff off on the desktop because mm -hmm. You know, I might be on the go. I think a, a project might be done, but I have like a last minute request on the client and I'm on the move. Now I could of course, you know, be reasonable and just tell them, yeah, I'll get it to you as soon as I can. But mm -hmm. if I want to just get it out of the way and I'm just sitting on the train, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, might as well just, I might you know. as well just, just get it done, get it over with. Mm -hmm. And I just have more peace of mind knowing that I do have this with me on mobile or on some kind of cloud device that I can just edit in Fresco and then just send to the client for a quick update if need be. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Steve is talking about Apple Pencil on the iPad. Yeah, I can I can honestly say because uh, Rav, Ravi is asking what pen are you using, and I can see that it's the Apple Pencil. Yeah, it's it's the first iteration of it. Yeah, that's the one I have as well, and yeah, it's yeah, yeah. honestly I was so impressed with it. Um, mm -hmm. I've never had any issues with the Apple Pencil, um, mm -hmm. and it has been it's something where I have. I've always used like Wacom products as far as like, like I have a small Cintiq and all of my tablets in the past have always been Wacom products. Um, and I have, I have tried briefly like other products, but I've never, I've never purchased those products that weren't, um, from Wacom just because I have such a great experience with the company and with its products. Um, but the mm -hmm. Apple pencil was the first time that I actually used something other than, um, uh, other than that. And I was very impressed with just, it's like the sensitivity and I've never had any lag with it. And it feels like yeah. I'm holding like a pencil. I actually think I might like the shape of it better than like the chunky, um, huge stylus, yeah. you know, that's, that's a, that's a good point. I find there's a couple of things. Cause so I'm a recent owner of a Cintiq. Like I literally bought it towards the end of last year. Nice. I bought the, the little 13 inch. Yeah. Um, that's what I have. The 13 inch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what? It's it's good. The mm -hmm. there's a couple of like ergonomic issues I have with it in mm -hmm. terms of like, especially with how you know small my desk is. I yep. sometimes I accidentally hit the touch mm -hmm. functions when I'm trying to reach my keyboard, or um, when I'm trying to um, you know rotate the pen to erase or whatnot. I'll accidentally click a button, and I mm -hmm. have that as a hotkey to switch screens, mm -hmm. and I'm constantly accidentally doing it. So there's like a lot of weird ergonomic things that I wish could be a little better. Mm -hmm. It's a great product, but yeah. um, I find the iPad has less nuances. And so I tend to work off of it more than my Wacom still. 
I, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. It definitely has. It's very, like, working working in Fresco with the Apple Pencil on the iPad is very straightforward. Um, mm-hmm. And I I feel like it's, I don't want to, I don't want to say that it's simple. I will say that it's, like, simplistic. It's very, it's mm-hmm. like the difference between, um, like, a to me, like, a, a very um, eclectically designed room and, like, a modern minimalist kind of room where I can see what I need um, and everything feels like it's exactly where it needs to be when I go to work in it and it and I, I don't have I don't have I don't feel like I have less than I need and I don't feel overwhelmed um, with what's there for me to use um, exactly but yeah I do I do understand like the juxtaposition between working on the iPad with the Apple pencil and working on the Cintiq is is different and I've actually seen like how people kind of cope with that um and some people they look for different like a different stylus for their wacom products and then some people actually put like a thick pencil grip on their apple pencil um, yeah I've seen so that, that yeah, yeah so that great. they can feel like kind of the same um well, Nicholas? I, I use one of these actually this is oh nice I, the glove yeah, yeah. the mm-hmm. little little ninja glove it makes you yeah. like look super super cool makes you feel professional yeah. oh yeah <laughs> nicholas would like to know if you're left or right-handed i am right-handed same, same. I'm right-handed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's funny that you mentioned uh, like um, like this how efficient or how minimal like the process is with the iPad versus the Wacom because mm-hmm. I find myself doing better work when I have less tools to work with. Yep. Which is I think another reason why I like to gravitate towards vector brush mm-hmm. because the rash brush is super powerful, especially in in fresco and the live brushes. Mm-hmm. But I almost never use them outside of basic need because. Um, my style doesn't require it. And number mm-hmm. two, I just, I also get overwhelmed when there's just like too many things in my, at my repertoire. Mm-hmm. So when I was learning 3D, like on cinema, or mm-hmm. like if you open like ZBrush, like there's yeah. just so many things. So much stuff. Like, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. It mm-hmm. took me like about a month, a month and a half to actually learn cinema properly. Whereas with Fresco, granted, you know, I, I had the, the fundamentals of working with you know, Photoshop and stuff like that, but it was it was just much much easier much more sort of um much less intimidating Mm -hmm. to to to, to approach yeah i agree i agree and it's funny you mentioned zbrush because i kind of when i when i jumped into that for the first time i kind of felt like i was like leaping into a lake just belly flopping off a cliff into i don't know what (laughs) we'll see um but yeah Yeah. when i when i sit down and use fresco i feel like i know where where everything's at um and uh, that's a good feeling. Um, and it's it's also um, interesting too, um, because like we're both illustrators, um, but you're um, more like the reason for vector seeming to resonate with you more than uh, raster brushes and things like that do is like my exact reasoning for feeling exactly the opposite, because I feel like my style doesn't. Um, doesn't like call for everything to be very precise and then also Mm. i feel like i don't do well when it comes to making things incredibly precise like i need a little bit more like room to hide with texture sometimes and i like to like Mm -hmm. be very painterly sometimes so raster seem to be like my thing but at the same time it's strange how we all pick like a kind of brush to use that feels a certain way, even though the reality is we're all using the exact same tool. We have the same Apple right. Pencil, we have the same iPad, and yet yeah. when we use a different brush within the program, we have a completely different experience. Agreed, um, yeah. Which is cool. A uh, nice bucket tool. Yes, I find yes. that that's one thing as somebody that uses like charcoal texture raster brushes, I will never get to fully enjoy the satisfaction of paint bucketing in a region and have it paint bucket perfectly because the my edges are <laughs> never like perfectly crisp and like, yeah. you know, <laughs> so I yeah, don't get I to mean, do that. <laughs> I mean, that's a blessing and a curse, right? Because it's like, on one end, yeah, there's that aspect. It's more mm-hmm. convenient to do it in vector. But then the other end, it's like sometimes, you know, you have to be so precise. Where like, because you saw sometimes I was filling things accidentally that mm-hmm. shouldn't have been filled. Gotta go find the opening. It Gotta- was a <laughs> microsoft, like, you know, like you have to zoom in so close and it would mm-hmm. be a gap like that or yep. like, like that. And it's yep. just like, you zoom out and it's like, how would you see that unless you- How would you know? How would you know? You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. yeah, there's, there's pluses and minuses, minuses to both, I think. 
Yep. Um, also, uh, Javon, Dra- Dravon Titus, I think is your name. Mm. That is like, that is like such a cool name. <laughs> Dravon Titus sounds like a fantasy dragon lord or something. So like, Dravon Titus. That's awesome. That's um, a name right there. <laughs> well, yeah, welcome to the chat. Um, and to your question, asking if there is an Adobe Illustrator Discord server, there is indeed. I believe Wade just posted the link. So thank you very much, um, Wade, for helping us out with that. Uh, I would also like to uh, do another reminder just to let everybody know um, that we do have um, uh, challenges happening um, this week. Uh, So if you check out the challenge tab above the chat, you can kind of see what we are uh, working on for today towards the uh, 30 minute mark. um, We have about 30 minutes left of the stream. Uh, Kervin and I are actually going to jump into the discord and take a peek at everybody's work and give you guys a little bit of feedback. Um, so, uh, if you would like to, to get, uh, kind of reviewed on the stream, um, and have us check out your work, please, uh, feel free to post in the, in the discord. Uh, and I also want to say something just from like personal experience, um, both being the person that reviews these things and also being the person that is doing the challenges and trying to share, uh, please do not hesitate to share your work, even if it is unfinished. Even if you post mm-hmm. a work in progress in the Discord, um, it's always great to get feedback when you're in middle of a project or maybe you don't really quite know where to go next um, and you get a little bit of feedback to help you further the process. Um, th- we're not going to judge you if you didn't finish it in time because we just did this challenge today. Um, but we'd love to see your work, even if just to look at what you've got going on and you can give us a description of what you intend to do next. That's totally cool. Awesome. So now I'm going to start going in and adding some of these additional little details here, like just some of the line details. Mm -hmm. And so what I like to do is for that, originally I'll have the pressure dynamics on just to have that sort of comic book, like, uh, sort of line work, fidelity, pressure sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I'll turn that off because now I want my. Uh, details in in the jacket to be a bit more consistent and it's also useful for my topography as well okay gotcha Um, so i'll probably bring this down i'll test to see yeah that looks about right maybe i'll go a little bit thicker yeah cool that should be good and so now i'm just going to start adding details to the seams nice yeah i'm so excited for this i also i really admire um the like your understanding of the garment because I think that you've added a lot of stuff that because I paint more than I mm. illustrate with lines, um, I have a completely different approach to this. And your lines, I feel like, suggest perfectly the kind of fabric and everything that you're doing from like the fact that nothing goes to like a point and you have like that nice dip where the seams are sewn together is very Mm -hmm. nice um and i also love that you don't have like tons of wrinkles in this fabric but the lines you did chose or choose to add to the jacket they suggest the fact that her arm is turning and where fabric is bunching and they all have like a very specific purpose um so i love it and it kind of ties back to our conversation we had off stream about anatomy, right? Where mm-hmm. it's like having those core fundamentals. So I, I've been like having fun with this stuff for years now. You can ask anybody, like this is the thing. And if you see the first iteration of me kind of freestyling off of fashion photography, mm-hmm. the clothes mm-hmm. don't necessarily look like they fit. They definitely feel more collage in terms mm-hmm. of it feeling more like it's tacked on than feeling like it's actually conforming to the body. And, and the part of that were like design choices, but also mm-hmm. just a limited understanding of how fabric works on on the human body mm-hmm. and so like understanding when a fabric turns how does it wrinkle where do you see the shadows things of that sort i have a very basic understanding of understanding what the light source is where where you know where it contorts where the arm twists and all that kind of stuff like mm-hmm. it, it, it's evolved over time through just like doing it and just practice and then also recently having some studies of those fundamentals that help inform how that fabric kind of works so mm-hmm. now i find myself not having to compensate as much by masking with like other sort of augmented details because i'm, I'm so sure that what i'm drawing actually is correct mm-hmm. you know what i mean like a, a lot of times people um one trick that uh, and i would do this too where if i'm drawing a figure and i can't quite figure out how to draw the waist i'll just cover it with a jacket mm-hmm. 
you know what I mean? it's, it's the old get away with it. yeah. the old drawing the hand in the pocket trick exactly. that is exactly, exactly what that is <laughs> that's exactly what that is and mm -hmm. so and so now it's like if you look at this versus where i was when i like what eight years ago when i started really like having fun with this style mm -hmm. it's like a world of a difference in terms of how the clothing operates it's it felt more flat back then as opposed to now it feels like it's actually three-dimensional yeah she looks like she's wearing this jacket even though she's like there's it's like photograph mixed with illustration like it feels like mm. she has this garment on um right. which is awesome uh i i think it's also um interesting to point out um what you said specifically about coming to the point to a point in your art where you're not sure how to do something or where to go next um and mm -hmm. i think it's important to maybe discuss that in a little bit more depth because and it's something that i've mentioned um before but i feel like anytime i have the opportunity to say it maybe i should say it um when i think when we create art it's very easy for us to come to points where we lack the knowledge to convey what we are trying to illustrate um, and yeah. in many cases it can be very obvious to do things like you said um, drawing a jacket over parts of the anatomy that you're unsure about and things like that um, mm -hmm. and i think that when we do that we kind of cripple our growth um, yeah. and we also I think it's like a it's like a bit of like lying to yourself about what you're doing and why and allowing yourself to develop um in not not the best way that you could and i found for a lot of years when i was working that a lot of things i would say i'm sure you've heard this before it's like oh no that's my style that's what mm. you know that's what i do because that's how because I, that's how I know how to do it, and that's how I'm comfortable doing it. Um, but when I really kind of took a step back and looked at all the things that I was attributing to being part of my style, quote unquote, um, mm -hmm. I found that some of those things were not necessarily my style. They were simply things that I started doing in lieu of increasing the amount of knowledge I had to convey a certain concept. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, I try now always to take a closer look whenever I find myself in a, in a, you know, in the middle of a project and I'm just like, hmm, what, what comes next that I catalog instantly. And I urge everybody else to do this like in chat too. When you come to that point, I would say catalog that feeling and discern Absolutely. that like, am I saying this because maybe I'm not sure really where I want to go with this piece or am I feeling that way because I don't know how. And if you don't know yeah. how, then s search for that knowledge, you know, search for a way to learn that thing, because I think it'll help us all in the long run to, to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, you, you, you said it exactly how I would say it. Cause, cause I, I'll tell you right now, it really wasn't until recently that I would let my mistakes sit mm -hmm. in my work. Um, and that's part of the reasons why I never really kept a sketchbook because mm -hmm. I absolutely hated keeping a sketchbook because just the concept of keeping just a, a, a whole sort of catalog of the stuff I dislike. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't seem appealing just to me. It just feels bad. It feels... just feels awful. And, yep. and the point of a sketchbook is to document the process, to recognize the mistakes, and to have 10 pages of drawing that same skull over mm -hmm. and over and over again to see the evolution, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you don't have to constantly be making things to show people. Like, mm -hmm. that's the thing that a lot of artists, I think, tend to forget. It's okay to do stuff for yourself and not share it. Mm -hmm. It's just for you to learn and it's like you know the the online classes we were talking about off stream as well it's like mm -hmm. I, i've been doing like a bunch of sketches in the sketchbook and i'll show some people here and there just to like let them in on my process but i'm not gonna like post that on my instagram yeah, just to for like you. get 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 a response it's, it's just for me mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah um yeah yeah, yeah very, cool. very well said yeah and i think i think too um just the way that because we also discussed like social media and stuff i think the way that a lot of artists present themselves on social media may also give beginners maybe a false understanding of what the reality of certain aspects of being an artist are and that's not a bad thing because like these days um and i'm sure everybody you know has felt like this at some point like having a social media presence and 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 posting your work on social media especially if you want to be like a self-employed like work from home freelancer which many of us that's a goal of ours posting beautiful pictures of our work and like really romantic 
like gorgeous iterations of like our processes on mm-hmm. social media is a very popular thing to do and it draws attention and it draws eyes. And one of the things that I found really discouraged me from actually working in a sketchbook and keeping a sketchbook seriously up until literally like three months ago was mm-hmm. seeing those gorgeous uh, images of like artists that use like um, ink or gouache paint or whatever posting like those two page spread like beautiful photographs of like a gorgeous painting they did in their uh in their sketchbook and then oh, or like yeah. or like auctioning a sketchbook yeah. off where they're like flipping through every page and logically i can look at it and be like this was the purpose of this sketchbook like this person made this sketchbook yeah beautiful but when i look at my own sketchbook of practice i'm like every time i turn the page i see something i hate and it doesn't Mm. feel good like it feels when i look at their sketchbook and then Mm. it discourages me from like keeping one of my own and i had to kind of like stop doing that and just learn how to be cool with like my weird ugly drawings that i hate to look at and just push through and improve you know instead of trying to be poetic about everything i put in the sketchbook Absolutely. And you know what, there's, this is a revelation that, you know, a lot of people don't really come to recognize when they see stuff like that, when they mm-hmm. see like the, the Kim jong Ji's of like, oh gosh, yeah, know, doing stuff just straight with ink, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like on a wall, it's just like, there's nothing more permanent than drawing something on someone's wall, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And it's like, I, I think what people need to recognize is he got there because of the years and years of slaving mm-hmm. to that point. It's it's not like he opened a sketchbook when he was 13 and just started doing that. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. He, like, guaranteed, I mean, sure, I'm sure he's a prodigy to be able to do what he does as an example. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he is. But even he had a starting point, and, like, mm-hmm. a lot of people do. Like, there's a, there's a lot of people who have these immaculate sketchbooks who, if you look at their sketchbooks 10 years ago, not good it's not not the same yeah not the same it's not the same and so it's like a lot of that is you know it's a couple of things here like the the first main thing is just through practice you just get better and Mm -hmm. like it'll just improve and when you get to a point of mastery where you can actually control there's like two things there's one thing where you can actually like actually visualize onto paper exactly what's in your head right in Mm -hmm. terms of mastery with with very little error but when it comes to making those mistakes, they also know how to mask it too. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like guarantee every single piece that he has done or any great artist has done, there's an error in there mm-hmm. that they feel like they had to mask or like maybe they had to correct or maybe they just embraced it and just kind of went along with it, which mm-hmm. I'm sure, especially a guy like Kim Jong Ji does. Oh yeah. The way he works, he mm-hmm. has to kind of improvise whenever he makes little errors. And it's okay because number one, their errors still look good to us, number one. But then number two, his years of experience has taught him how to mask those errors as well. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you can't expect to get on that type of level of improvisation without putting in the legwork in yep. the beginning. Yep. You know what I mean? It and just, it's, it's just not gonna happen. It's kind yeah. of like that whole, like, like, you know, people asking like, how much do I charge for my work? How do I get into that aspect of business? How do I mm-hmm. figure that out? And I always tell people like, their that that time that you're talking about that you that people put into their work to get to where they are that's Mm. something that is so valuable that there should be a charge in you know how you charge for your work specifically for that because some people say like um uh and i feel like that's that's in like any profession in any aspect of work for example i was watching Mm -hmm. uh i like to watch those court shows you know, where people, oh, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, uh, in in one of the situations, uh, a gentleman was was being sued for having charged a lot of money to fix a woman's car when he had only put 15 minutes of work into the car. And he said, I didn't charge you for 15 minutes uh, fixing the car. I charged you for the 40 years it took me to learn how to do it mm-hmm. in 15 minutes. That's mm-hmm. what I charged you for. Um, Mm -hmm. And that is how it goes in art as well. When you, just because you take a a short amount of time to do something or because you figure out, um, like Kervin said, how to mask those things, how to flow with those um, errors and how to produce um, a a work of art in a professional manner in a short period of time or just differently than some other people do, that does not mean that it's worth any less. In fact, I think when you can do something in 15 minutes, um, it's in a in an interesting way. It has a 
totally different kind of value because of absolutely. the fact that you did it that way, you know, yeah. and it's important. It's very yeah, important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that what you just said there about like, you know, it's not the amount of time spent actually doing the work, but mm -hmm. the years of experience that you're paying for. Mm -hmm. That was also a recent revelation of mine as well, like that I didn't learn until maybe like five years ago when I was having conversations with people who also freelance. And it's just like, mm -hmm. you have to understand that, yes, I might be able to do this thing very quickly, but I'm not ripping them off because I'm charging them this much. They still like they're coming to me because of my level of expertise in the mm -hmm. work, too. Like. It's like, you know, every industry has this consulting, for example, like mm -hmm. hiring someone to just come in and just give you feedback on something because mm -hmm. of their years of experience. They're able to charge an arm and a leg because that solution, however quick it might have been offered, comes from their years of experience and time spent getting to those sophisticated solutions. So Absolutely. it's like you, you got to pay their due. You just have and that's to. literally what you're asking for, as you say, like you're not at, like you can ask anybody to say, hey, does this look cool? And people go, oh, yeah, that looks pretty cool, you know? And some people who are less experienced might give you, like, pretty good feedback because maybe they're very intuitive and very good at communicating and expressing um, their thoughts and feelings on your piece. But mm -hmm. you would pay somebody who's been working in the industry for 20-plus years to look at it and tell you exactly what you need to change in 10 minutes rather than asking your buddy um, if he thinks it looks neat. Uh, because you you don't you don't want it to look neat. You want to improve and become more professional and hear from somebody that really knows what they're talking about exactly what they see in your work. You know, exactly. and that's like paying for experience. That is a huge huge thing that a lot of people, as you say, don't really figure out for a long time, where they don't realize that that's you know a serious um, part of the process. Um, because if you think about it too, it's kind of like the like the difference between people also struggle like charging charging a fixed rate for their work and charging hourly for their work um mm -hmm. and it's it's weird because like when you do start gaining that experience and you do start getting to that point where you can fix a car door in 15 minutes even though it takes you know your competitor four hours um mm -hmm. are you supposed to charge hourly for that are you supposed to right. start making less money the better you get? No. Yeah. You're there should be a graph to, you know, for that. <laughs> I feel like there's a graph for that. Like there has after to a be. while, <sighs> you know, you need to flip the way you you charge because mm -hmm. you're right. Like you, you can't be charging hourly for something that you've mastered. Because again, like comparatively to a novice, mm -hmm. say you're both charging the same rate, you're gonna get ripped off. Like yep. you, you're gonna have to it, it comes down to again, like you would charge a lump sum. Like mm -hmm. you just have to. You and have like, to. You, yeah, yeah, there's no other way around it. And you might even combine the two. You might even charge a lump sum for the work and then charge an hourly rate for any changes you need to make, you know? Yeah, there's yeah. there's a lot of ways to go about it. Um mm -hmm. but like that that right there was the thing that really opened my eyes cuz I was like, okay, I now am doing an entire brand identity for a client in the time it used to take me to do a small sketch commission like five right. years ago and why do I feel like I'm not being paid what I'm worth and why am I what you know like this was like three or four years ago where I was like why am I struggling for cash when I feel like I've practiced so much and I've gotten so far why am I not why do my finances not reflect all of that time mm -hmm. and it's and it was because my process did not reflect my time um right. my my process exactly. in not just um work but my process as far as conducting my personal business no longer reflected my uh my skill level and the time that i had put into it and so that needed to evolve agreed yeah yeah that, no yeah you nailed it that's exactly right that's exactly right vanessa says when do you decide how to charge flat versus hourly um I decided when to charge flat versus hourly when I looked at how long it was taking me to finish the projects yeah. that I was doing and felt like I was getting ripped off a little bit, you know? Like mm -hmm. I was looking, I was like, okay, I I worked hard on this and I finished it in a timely manner, but I don't feel like the the resulting payment for this is is worth it. Um, mm -hmm. I would have exactly. to be doing so many more serious, t like huge jobs in order to be paid what I wanted. So I was like, that's, that's it then. That's like, I'm not feeling it in my heart anymore that this is right for me. Got to make the change now. Um, yeah. I find it for me, it's, it's, it still sometimes can be a case by case basis. And what mm -hmm. I mean oh, yeah. by that is it, it depends on what the client asks for. Right. Cause mm -hmm. like sometimes, especially if it's like, you know, it's going to be an ongoing project. Oh, yeah. So 
project that you know you're going to be engaged with them for months and months and months mm -hmm. sometimes a fixed rate doesn't really do you justice either because after a point you're like wow like i've done so much work in these three months mm -hmm. and i only charge this much where if i had charged a daily rate mm -hmm. i would be making Make much more. more for my time right so mm -hmm. it there's a bit of that too but then also i think um when it comes to the the charging the, that fixed rate or that daily rate you also have to consider usage as well mm -hmm. that's like another big thing that a lot of artists tend to forget to charge for is like usage and and what we mean by that is how are they going to be using it if it's mm -hmm. typically like something just within social media usually you don't need to consider any other additional fees at least mm -hmm. in my opinion mm -hmm. but when it comes to additional forms of media television print ad um other forms of websites t-shirts licensing it's yeah. huge also like um if they want to own the rights to that piece that mm -hmm. should be expensive for them too like mm -hmm. you have to consider that as well um, as opposed to you retaining those rights and being able to do with it as you see fit once the project is done. Yeah. Um, how long do they want to hold on to the rights for? Like, there's all these different, like, I swear freelancers deserve like a business class for this type of stuff. Because I'm totally. still figuring things out on my own as well. I actually um, have specific things that I actually won't do for a project because mm. of certain complications with that. Because um, I, like I was telling you before, I you know, have been partnered over on Twitch for a lot of years. And, um, one of the ways that I like supplemented my income, um, was, uh, because I knew about Twitch and I knew what you would want as a partner. Um, mm. I could put together like huge branding packages and stuff for other streamers, design their channels, design, um, uh, all sorts of things. And one thing that a lot of larger streamers want is a t-shirt. Um, you know, design. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I found myself in a situation where I designed a t-shirt for somebody and I was kind of at the beginning of my career, but still at that point, my skill level was, I, it, I was capable of doing the job that this person needed done. Um, and I didn't charge very much. I charged, um, like a, like a flat rate that I wasn't confident in because at that point I was afraid to ask for what I was worth. You know, yeah. still kind of in that timid stage. We were um, all there. We we're all there for that. Yeah, for sure. and and I and he, and I got paid for my work, um, but then I it was a really weird feeling because I got I think I got paid like a hundred and fifty bucks for a flat illustration, and then that person ended up making like forty fifty thousand dollars off of the shirt. Mm -hmm. And there was no connection to me. There was like one post that was like, this is the yeah. person that designed the shirt. But I realized I couldn't, I couldn't really be mad because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't understand about all that licensing stuff until later. Um, and it's like, it's definitely something that needs to be considered because when somebody is making merchandise with your work, it's like, okay, like investigate royalties, investigate licensing. How long is this person allowed to continue to use my art? What are they allowed mm -hmm. to do with it? I've also made logos for people in the past who then decided they were going to add some Photoshop magic to the logo like they wanted and then start printing stuff for clients and posting it on social media still as my work. And I was like, ah, that's a weird thing too, because do you want to be credited for somebody also Photoshopping a bunch of extra stuff onto your yeah, project? Like and then saying with. it's yours yeah <laughs> so it's it's a very it's a very interesting slope and it's definitely dependent on the specifics of what you do um yeah. agreed but agreed. but doing the research on it is very important yeah and that's interesting too like that's something even i don't even think about it's like allowing uh your clients um like private commissioners to augment your work after the fact after mm -hmm. you pay for it it's like I'd be, like it's like one of those things that because how often do you create a piece and then you send it to a client and then they just butcher it it's just like come on man i've like, had it happen <laughs> like like more time like not not a lot but like more times than i'm comfortable with and i'm like why is this a thing why? <laughs> yeah. but i guess like when you're not when you're not a designer um and you're and you're business calls for certain elements of design that's not really like it's not in it's not in your wheelhouse and it's not what you do like maybe you mm -hmm. are you know you're a you're a realtor and you want somebody to like design business cards and stuff for you like you you have an eye for your job but not for designing 
business cards and things, which is why you hired somebody to do it for you. And so yeah. that person's understanding of how things should be presented and should be done is completely different. And I think it's also um, a little bit of that, like, this might sound weird, but it's kind of, it's kind of similar to the way that people, um, I guess, react to um, and revere like a celebrity in that it's a mm. it, this is a person who performs a service and gives a form of entertainment but it's very easy for a lot of people to only see them as a form of entertainment or a thing and less mm -hmm. of like a substantial person with a specific personality and and mm. all of these things just like everybody else when you mm -hmm. hire somebody to do a design it's very easy to see that design as simply a product yeah um this this thing that you maybe could not do yourself that you paid somebody for this product and usually you go to the store and you buy something at the store what you do with it is your business. You know, if I go right. and I buy a towel set for my bathroom and then maybe I decide that I don't like them and I and I toss them away or or whatever, whatever I buy, whatever I do, once I bring it to my house and I have it in my own possession, what I do with that thing is my business. But mm -hmm. when you when you when somebody designs something for you, I think it's very easy for people not to realize that their entire livelihood and reputation is also attached to that thing. So however yep. you transform it and present it to the world is going to be how people also possibly see that person. Yep. Um, it, it's so it, it's you weird. Basically, <laughs> it's like a form of your own DNA that you're just like mm -hmm. giving up. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's like, it, it's quite a personal thing to, especially giving up the rights to something that you that you created it's like Whew. that is intellectual property mm -hmm. that now you're like okay it is yours to do with as you please and thus why it should be very expensive for them to be able to do that yeah definitely my opinion yeah um so maybe uh because we've done a lot of discussion about like art as a profession and art as mm. a lifestyle and things maybe we yeah. can kind of loop back and discuss a little bit more about your actual physical process here in fresco i know you're working with uh maybe, maybe you can like do like a little recap of what you've done and explain the brushes you're using and why yeah sure so predominantly i've been using the vector brush um and i've been jumping around between playing with the brush sizes the smoothing and toggling the brush dynamics mm -hmm. um like i mentioned before i toggled off the brush dynamics to have some consistency with the seam line work just so that i have like a very consistent thin line mm -hmm. um and then i've been toggling back and forth with the paint bucket tool as well as like a quick way of sort of filling in objects for example here and like not having to have to color it in like you would like a typical coloring book or like a traditional art piece. Just yeah. like a great way to save time. Mm -hmm. um, so now what I'm gonna show you guys is how I start to inject color into this nice. using, the, using the fill. Uh, back in the day when I was using Fresco, um, I used to do it like this where I would draw my shape, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that it's closed. And then I would just fill it in and mm -hmm. voila that be done but now what i do is i like using the lasso tool actually nice. and here's why the lasso tool if you hold down you could just draw organic shapes or you can tap to have straight lines which i think is super useful when it comes to creating those uh marquee shapes to fill objects with right kervin um, you just blew my mind because i myself did not know that yeah no the it's, tapping it's, the tapping is a game changer. It is, and it is something that I just kind of did by accident. And I was like, uh -huh. oh snap, and I, just, I was just having a ball, just going nuts. So, cause before that I would just be using, like back in the in the draw days, they would mm -hmm. have like, you know, a ruler, French curves, mm -hmm. things of that sort to create those shapes. But now it's like, I could just use it with the lasso and, and I'll be done. This is so amazing. Now, I hope everybody yeah, caught that just now. Vanessa's like, yeah, <laughs> <And> <laughs> Vanessa, my sentiments exactly. Because I, I was like, I remember I thought to myself if, and I usually use like the, the lasso, like the regular lasso tool in my own work. But part of me, um, a few times have been like the, but the, like the, the polygonal lasso tool, huh, wherefore art thou? I love thee. <laughs> I need it. And I, and I sometimes, um, I will be working and I will like, take one tool and do as much with it as I possibly can because I yeah. like to I like to like relax and like sit on my couch or on my bed or in my yard and stuff when I'm using 
fresco just because it's so convenient. Um, and I'm usually like reclining like with my head on my hand. So I kind of like to just like keep my pencil in my hand and use the one tool for as long as I possibly can and uh, not switch uh, yeah. to anything. Exactly. So this is like, um, ooh. Yeah, it's a, it's a game changer. So now I have that closed, right? I got my marching mm -hmm. ants. And um, if for those of you who are using it or are following on for the first time, it might look like something like this. And mm -hmm. you can just toggle back and forth if you hit on the more on the bottom between mm -hmm. marching ants and section overlay. I like the marching ants because it's old school. It's so you can really see it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I just go on my paint bucket. Um, I'm going to use a gray for now just for visibility purposes because okay. I'm not ready to add color yet. And I just fill. And then it'll ask me if I want it to be a vector or a pixel. And that asks that question because the layer that it's in is not categorized yet. You mm -hmm. can see on the right there, the blue outlined layer, it doesn't have a symbol next to it. So Fresco is not sure exactly what, what to fill it in. So you got to specify and then that's it, done. Nice. And then, I'll, and then I'll do the same thing for the other side as well. Lasso, just come through, yeah. Sometimes I just like to click through if I like just just like save time like yeah boom done yeah <laughs> without yeah. having to like be super accurate along the curve depending on how the curve the curve works like i might like take my time with it and just try to go along as much as i can um but sometimes if it's just like a straight line yeah i'll just cut across like done nice it saves so much time like so much time oddly enough i think and this is weird because i i feel like i've done so many different things like in the programs on Adobe Live, but for me, mm. for whatever reason, the one thing that makes me the most, I, I, I'm gonna use the word nervous, mm. um, and like I'm like spending a lot of time in one area, oddly is using the lasso tool. Like on, uh, and this is like, and this is making me like, look at this, like, I'm going to be so fast now doing yeah. <laughs> this. This is going to be so great. Cause I always, I'm one of those people where like, I will lasso something and control Z and lasso and control Z until I get Dude. it perfect. And now I can just yeah. be very precise and be like, look at me chat. Yeah. <laughs> I am so good at this lasso thing. <laughs> exactly. And like, you know, you notice here, I forgot to add the negative space in, in the arm area there. Mm -hmm. So I'll just pick that and then I could just hit those three dots on the right, mm -hmm. um, the layer actions, I should say, and then go to um, cut selection. Nice. And then that's it, done. And what's nice about that feature actually, like say you draw something on a layer by accident, but mm -hmm. you want it in that same position and, um, but you just want it on a different layer. So yeah. let's say for example here, like I drew like this mark, I'm like, oh snap, I didn't mean to have that on this layer. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is just, you know, select that you hit cut selection and then you hit paste selection and it'll paste it in the exact exactly. same. So it's like the same thing as hitting command J or mm -hmm. like uh, command F in Illustrator or command J in Photoshop. Yep. Um, it's the same exact vibe. Um, another thing that I would like to point out about the lasso tool, um, because there might be people in chat who do not know about it. Um, when you're using the lasso tool, uh, you'll notice that if you just like circle, if you just like circle something real quick or whatever, and you don't close the lasso, it'll ask, it'll be like, you can, you can actually go down to the bottom. It'll say like cancel lasso or close lasso, and you can close it real mm. quick and, and do your thing. But, um, for those of you who are incredibly precise and just maybe want like a, a, a faster workflow, it it only removes like a few seconds, but I find that it's very comfortable. Um, there actually is a little circle um, at the end or at the, the start of your lasso stroke um, that you mm. may or may not have noticed. So when you go around and you're doing your your lasso and you're selecting things, um, all you have to do to close your lasso is bring it to that dot instead of yep. zooming in like to be precise. Yeah, because one mm. thing that, that you do like in Photoshop, at least when you're closing the lasso, you bring the teeny tiny points together and it will give you like a little icon with like a circle next to your lasso um, uh, cursor to let you mm -hmm. know that you are about to close it. Um, but I find that that larger dot makes me feel like I have more control and like I don't have to be perfectly 100% absolutely uh, precise about where I'm putting the tip of my pen um, yeah. on the canvas and it closes it automatically, which is nice. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, it, it, that dot actually is, is a game changer too, because I'm the same, like sometimes there's something like so final about creating each lasso point in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. 
because you can undo it mm -hmm. but there's something about like especially if you like accidentally close it or something there's just something weird fresco they, they figured it out and they've made it work a bit yeah. more efficiently, i think and it's it's an interest it's interesting how that mechanism has made me so comfortable uh, mm. in the program too, because I realized when I realized what the dot was, cause the first time I used Fresco, I kind of just jumped into it just to see what it was, what it was about. I didn't really watch any tutorials. I'd seen somebody use it on, um, Adobe live once. And I was like, I'm just going to jump in here and, and noodle around. Um, and I remember when I realized what that dot was and what it was helping me do, I was like, this is so great because the alternative is that maybe I'm zoomed out completely of my entire entire uh canvas and i have to just guess where that point is mm -hmm. and hope that i close it smoothly mm -hmm. but closing it with that dot it closes it smooth as if you place the point exactly where you needed to place it and it's perfect instead of having that you know that dreaded little like jagged point that you can sometimes get if you release the lasso and then it just kind of like the points aren't connected so it just puts a line I used to just put yeah. like, a, you know, and you're like, yeah. oh no, <laughs> do not like. <laughs> yeah, no. And then you have to redo it all again sometimes. That's the worst. Like, I remember um, when I first discovered saving your selection. Oh, this yes. Really yeah. Uh, but mm -hmm. that, that saved me quite a bit of time back in the day, being able mm -hmm. to save that selection. Oh, load new, load previous selections. Like, yes, I don't want to trace over this tomato again or like mm -hmm. whatever it was. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it definitely is a big help when you're able to do that. I had a similar feeling, um, when I used the, like the new and improved, um, subject selection or object selection, um, in Photoshop and Fresco. And I was like, oh, wow, I can just take a deep <laughs> breath and sigh happily. This is great. <laughs> yeah, dude. It, it, yeah. It's funny. Like when you like, cause you, you're so used to working a certain way. And then like when you discover something that just changes your whole workflow, like this changes your whole perspective on something. It just like, mm -hmm. just makes your day. It's such a, it's just a nerd moment, but it's so, it's so, so like, I could have satisfying. been doing this the whole time. And now that I, now that I know about it, it's going to be so nice. Yeah, like, exactly. It's exactly like that. Good oh, feels all around. Um, also, I want to point out, we got, uh, just, just over, uh, 20 minutes, I believe until we jump into reviewing some of the challenge uh, entries. So if you folks are interested in, uh, getting some feedback on the work that you've done for today's challenge, or maybe you haven't entered the challenge yet, but you'd like to check it out and whip something together real quick. Um, please feel free. Uh, I think Wade will post our, um, discord link into the chat. And if you want more details on what today's challenge is and, uh, how to get involved in that, all you have to do is check check the uh, challenge tab above uh, the chat. And there is uh, instructions in there for how everything works and where you can find more info on how everything works. Um, we're gonna pull, like I said, up the Discord for Photoshop and we're gonna dive in and just look at things that people posted. Uh, if you haven't finished and you don't think that you will finish before the deadline, fear not. All works in progress are welcome. We would love to just get to get a glimpse of what you're working on. Um, and also it just feels really cool to be able to like, highlight you folks that participate in the challenge on the stream, give you a shout out, give you some feedback and just let you know that we appreciate you um, for being here and for sharing your work with us. So absolutely. Yeah. Definitely yeah, a cool thing. Process. Ooh, Adobe live is in the house. Also very excited about you because there's way more than one in in the name curve in that they're typing there. <laughs> Everyone adding all these extra letters to your name to show their love and appreciation. I'm digging <laughs> yeah. it. I'm sure I wonder if my some of my coworkers are on there. I'm sure they are. I'm probably probably one or two of them are on there, I'm sure. Hiding in there. Yeah. Nice. Or not. Or or just being very active. Last Sunday just... was super active too. <laughs> That's, that's like every once in a while I have, um, the same thing where like people come over from Twitch cause they hear I'll be on Adobe live and I'm just like, all the yelly ones are mine. <laughs> I know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> it's all love. It's all love. I hope they bring that lasso functionality to Photoshop. That would be interesting. That would be super that would interesting. Be interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always like thought like they would merge Illustrator and Photoshop at to some capacity or like maybe there'll be like a desktop version of fresco that would be interesting that would be interesting uh, yeah because yeah. fresco is kind of like a merge of of like the two like illustrators from illustrator and photoshop kind of meet in the middle like okay we're yeah. all in this together here we go yeah literally yeah and and like the idea of it i 
probably was daunting at the time because I mean mm -hmm. those two programs are just so massive. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't have imagined the mess of code that would have to go into making that a reality. So oh yeah, um, yeah, that would be just that would be just daunting. And the so, and they're like you said they're so they're so large. It's like I, I frequently say like using Photoshop. Um, obviously I, like, I personally, like, I strive to, like, know as much about Photoshop as I can, um, but it's one of those programs where, like, people who use it professionally full-time, you can still discover incredible things within it because depending on what you do, there's, like, certain segments of the program that you might not ever really explore and ever oh, use because it's, I yeah. Know for a fact. There's tons of stuff where I'm just like, you can do that? I've been mm -hmm. using this for 10 years and you can do that? How did I not know? And they're like, yeah, that came out like several updates ago. And I'm like, okay, I am yeah. a young grasshopper. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I got to figure that out. Yeah, dude. Like, I, yeah, there's like a lot of like, because there's, there's just so many ways to do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's just, it's just normal for like, if you were given, you and I were given a task to do a portrait mm -hmm. and it had to be a certain color, you had to utilize these patterns mm -hmm. and, you know, we would show our process guaranteed both of our tutorials would be totally wildly different, different. yeah like wildly different or like a better example would be giving us uh, an image to recreate mm -hmm. like it would be like literally night and day i'm sure between three or four different artists you'll find three or four or five six different ways to do it totally totally yeah. and and that's the thing too is that like i think i think something that i see um in the uh in the Behance chat a lot too is like when we have just like anybody working anybody um uh guesting uh here kind of working on a piece no mm -hmm. matter what it is they're usually um every stream are always like a handful of people saying well why why don't you do it this way or why didn't you use this or why didn't you use that and it's been like a oh, really yeah. eye-opening thing for me and i i tell people i say you know there are so many ways to do the exact same thing this is just mm -hmm. one of them you know, and mm -hmm. it, and it, that's like very much like what you said about like you you get a handful of artists together and you give them the same program with the same tools and the same specifications that a piece needs to adhere to, and you will still get so many different ways of producing that artwork because the the programs are so vast and they allow you so much freedom to do yep. what you want that you can develop your own way of working, which is really cool. Yeah, exactly. So now yeah. I'm just adding some details to the fire here. Just a little bit. Just to get it I love that, by the way. That's very satisfying oh, to watch the the lines like adhere to the flames. <laughs> yeah, nice. and you know, it's, it's funny. Like, there's like two different ways to do it, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I too find it interesting where, like, because it's digital, I think I tend to do the black line work first. But mm -hmm. in reality, if you just have a single sheet of paper, yeah, like, unless it's like watercolor or something, I guess, like, mm -hmm. you would typically lay the colors down first and then put the black. Oh yeah. yeah, that's usually the process. So I feel like that all the time when I when I'm painting and I realize, man, if I was using like actual oil paints or gouache or whatever, none of this would work. My right. whole and I tried it. <laughs> I, I went to the store, I got some paints, I bought a canvas, and I promptly ruined it because I realized that like my because I do digital art, I can paint. I still know how to paint. I still can make mm -hmm. something that looks good, and I can sell it, and it looks you know it's professional work. But my technique and my approach to that work is not always conducive to using a traditional medium because um, unless I have some special settings on when I paint over something I paint over it I don't mix that blue and that red whenever right. I paint in the same area and the layers and like all that stuff um, but uh, it's it's very interesting um, just like diving into technique and process and everything um, like we've been talking about and it's also very right. eye-opening um and gives a lot of cool insight into like the thoughts and and uh process of your peers you know right it can be really Absolutely. cool i think you can have like six thousand layers or something outrageous i don't actually know how many layers you can have in a photoshop document but i know i've had like 700 layers before Ooh, I think yeah the most i i try you can ask my coworkers about this. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a bit of a stickler when it comes to like process. I think mm -hmm. when I started like using the, the program, yeah, I was, I was a loose cannon, just mm -hmm. hundreds of layers. And I don't think I've ever gotten past maybe 500 though, because again, like I, I like to collapse mm 
mm -hmm. my stuff. And part of that is because when I started working in Adobe stuff, I, I uh, wasn't using the most high tech hardware. Mm -hmm. like, it, it would just slow down. So I had to optimize. Had to keep it, yeah. You just, you just have to. So I think it's just something that stayed with me. So it's um, my, my layers now, um, for example, this piece, mm -hmm. like it, maybe, maybe I'll add another 10 more to mm -hmm. that. And that's usually what my files look like typically. And then gotcha. I'll have them, and then I'll have them kind of organized or labeled or, or something. But mm -hmm. again, very different process. Like if I was more raster focused and, and I wanted to like, you know, maintain certain editability with some, some brush techniques or textures, I probably have more layers, but because my, my style is very sort of pop art and very, uh, I guess you could say a bit more minimal in terms of the, the detail and the mm -hmm. amount of elements in there. There's no need for it to be more than like 20, maybe 30 layers at the most. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I typically, I think, I think I'm more organized with it now, but I've said before, like usually when I make layers, I make layers for the purpose, like the sole purpose of not totally ruining what's on the layer beneath it. Like I'll yep. do a stroke and I'll be like, oh, that's nice. That looks awesome. Don't want to ruin it make a new yeah. layer above it so i don't <laughs> so i don't like go in a like go backwards essentially um tell, tell me about it like how crazy is it to think now that because of because we know our own style so well mm -hmm. even a certain stroke like if it doesn't look like a, a something as small as like a stroke if it's mm -hmm. not the right thickness or like mm -hmm. doesn't have the right tapering you or the texture it. or yeah. i'm just like nope that one's not gonna work this one yeah. tiny line in the midst of like what's gonna essentially be like a gigantic painting i'm like this line is unacceptable yeah, I, no. will, <laughs> I will not allow it to continue on <laughs> no this is, this, this is true this is so so true um I find it funny that that that's the kind of specificity we have now with with the work that we do. It's like mm -hmm. even like even a certain stroke needs to feel the right way. It yep. doesn't even it can't, it can't even be a big picture like that. Like it has to be that sort of small and tiny. And it goes back to like earlier. I was saying that we're all doing art. We're using like the same iPad. We're using the same Apple Pencil. And technically, everything feels exactly the same when we make mm -hmm. each stroke, no matter what we're doing. And yet, I'm like. Mm -hmm that's not chalky enough. This doesn't feel charcoaly enough. It doesn't feel yeah. pastel enough. I'm going to have to redo this one. And then meanwhile, you know, Kervin's over here using a vector brush, making these perfect, precise like lines. Same thing, same thing, yeah. but it's, it's yeah. like a mental thing, you know? It is. It, it totally is a mental thing. I feel like, like, yeah. And like, how often do you see like, like when you're complimenting someone's work and they're like, Oh, I don't know. I feel like it could be better. And you're like, really? Like, yep. And it's, 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 I struggle with it, saying that to other people and getting that reaction and also giving that reaction and in, initially to people who say the same thing to me, I'm like, wow, right. that's great. And I'm just looking at it. Like I can see everything I hate about it. I don't know. Right. <laughs> um, also we got a question here from Kyle, um, who says, uh, Kirvin, do you typically work from a reference photo? Like you have in this illustration? When it comes to like the photo illustration stuff. Yeah. I'm always working, um, on fashion stuff for clients, things of that sort. But um, when it comes to just my traditional, like if I'm doing portraits or characters, um, I only have a reference to look at when it comes to making sure the anatomy is correct. So mm -hmm. like, if I wanna make sure that the torso is twisting the right way or like the arms feel like the correct length, yeah, I'll have like reference photos just to study and just make sure that it looks correct. Especially when it comes to things like hands mm -hmm. and like, Ex facial expression like that's really hard for me right now to kind of do that off the top of my head i need to be able to see like oftentimes you'll laugh like i'll do things like this with my hands I'll just oh be like, i'm like, in the thick it of it supposed to be yeah, yeah i totally get it in fact this this past week i because hands are probably my weakest suit to be perfectly mm. honest me too um and i did the old well maybe this character likes to have her hands in her pockets <laughs> maybe that's <laughs> it's not it's not about me not drawing the hands it's about the the personality of the character man no i i, I can't draw hands i'm i i probably have gosh i probably have in my entire professional portfolio i probably have like four hands and <laughs> and they're they're in pairs so it's like two paintings that have somebody showing both of their hands and that's that's like it and uh, I, I have found that, because um, this past week I was like, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna draw some hands. I've, 
had like that big moment where I was like, oh my gosh, I know very little about this. And then I mm. watched a bunch of tutorials and everybody teaches how you should paint hands differently every time. And I was like, oh no, I should just look at my own. And then I did that where I'm just sitting there forming the claw and like yeah, trying yeah. to like, how do I get this from the right angle? And then I took pictures of my own hands and yeah, then my reference no. pictures didn't look that good. And I was like, I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a, it can feel like a losing battle. And that's why I like looking at those online courses because they really break down the geometries. Mm -hmm. That's what helped me understand it finally mm -hmm. was the hand is not like just a hand, like it's tubes, like yeah. just break it down as tubes and like try to understand the relationship of those tubes to each other. Like, you know, this is like the palm is a trapezoid. Then mm -hmm. you have five different tubes and they're at different lengths. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just really forces you to analyze. And it was something that I actually had from architecture already, where mm -hmm. it was understanding the proportions of buildings. Mm -hmm. So in our sketchbooks, and, and I hated sketching in architecture too. Like I just didn't, I didn't like my sketchbook because it just didn't look pretty, right? Like yeah, we were talking yeah. about. But doing that, like looking at the basilica and like understanding the relationship of, you know, the column to the to the top of the roof, to the dome, like mm -hmm. those relationships, forcing myself to understand that, it translates, I think, to the human body too. Like the the ratio of the head to the body of the to the height of the body, to the width of the shoulders, mm -hmm. to that relation to the hips, to the pectorials and how they meet with the shoulders, like all of that stuff is is it comes down to just understanding relationships. So if you can get that down with the hand or whatever else you're struggling with, like just keep it as basic geometries, forget the knuckle and the nails and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I find it super easy to add that detail on the top. And it's the same with like doing poses too. It's like yeah. now I just spend the time in the very beginning to nail the pose, mm -hmm. whether it's a stick figure or like a geometric balloon shaped figure just to nail the gesture down mm -hmm. before going over it again to do like um anything super nuanced like like um like like adding muscles for example so like a lot of my sports illustrations will start that way i'll get the gesture down of like a sprinter's head to the mm -hmm. back to the to the buttocks to the to the pointed of the toe when mm -hmm. it's on the track and then once i feel that gesture feels good then i do the gesture of the driving knee and then how the arms are, and it's just literally just these lines. Mm -hmm. And you could do the same thing for hands too. It's just like, you lay down just, my hands start off as like just stick figures. Like just like literally pinky, ring finger, middle finger, pointer finger, thumb. Mm -hmm. And then I have like a, a, a big circle or a trapezoid for the palm. And then if that feels good in relation to what my reference is doing, then I start going into that in details. And that's yeah. awesome. That's really, yeah. really cool. You know what, yeah. you know what really, that what really like blew my mind about hands when I, when I actually read like an article kind of describing like things that you should keep in mind when you're illustrating hands. Um, right. and this was something that it's like obvious when you look at your hand, but when you go to draw a hand, it's for me, it's never been obvious. And that is like, when you look at your hand, the dip between each finger, that little curve when your fingers are spread apart. Yeah. Um, if you look at your palm, mm -hmm. there it goes down a certain distance. But if you look at the back of your hand, it goes down way farther than it does on the palm. Right. And, right. and I, I don't know why that was like such a profound thing for me, which I was just like, that's why all of my hands look like really <laughs> like, un, like, un, like non-expressive gloves rather than yeah. like a person's hand is because I was doing that area, it was like the same distance on the front and back of the hand. And I was like, no, there's like an, an extra dip and there's like runs there between the knuckles and there's all that stuff. Um, yeah. And then I was like, oh, okay. Like I'm still working on it, but like learning those little things, as you said, and like figuring it out, kind of making it make sense in its, you know, to in your mind before you just try to like, I'm gonna draw a whole hand. You know, yeah. like trying to break it down into like different core components like that before you start illustrating the whole thing is better. And then once you know that, it's the same thing as fixing a car in 15 minutes versus fixing a car in four to six exactly. hours. Exactly. That's why Kim Jong Ji is able to draw those figures mm -hmm. without laying down a skeleton, like with just straight ink, because yeah. he can foresee those geometries. Yeah, so he it's doesn't like, have to put them in. He just knows that they're there. He, he can just feel knows them, it. And then he draws yeah. it. But it takes time, yeah. you know? It does take time. And a lot of the greats, they trace photos mm -hmm. that's like one of the ways they learn it like 
Um, so for example, with this one, like you see your hand here, it's like, if I want to understand the hand, you want to break down the geometry. So I see this shape, that's mm -hmm. a trapezoid. And I see a trapezoid here. And then this is like a triangle. Mm -hmm. And then these guys could just be like tubes, right? Yeah. And so it's like, once you break that down, you could start to see like, and it's understanding like what's connected to what too, like that pinky is, is connected to that trapezoid. So it's like, you have this guy here, mm -hmm. that that's the pinky. And then you have the, that ring finger mm -hmm. there. And then the thumb is connected to this muscle. Mm -hmm. That's meant to be the wrist, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and honestly, I, I don't know what's happening behind the hair, but I can tell that, you know, there's this portion here mm -hmm. and that's going to be like, you know, that's one finger. And then that's, that's another finger. Like, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And it's like, because you lay down the foundation and like, you can refine and erase and refine, but you have the basic core that when it comes to finalizing the piece, you're not worried about error because you have the, the core there. Yeah. So it's like those types of things are just, they're just game changers for you. I feel like when yeah. it comes to understanding composition, breaking down composition. And like, it's the same case for graphic designers too. Like they're not drawing figures, but they're still having to figure out compositions, proportions, mm -hmm. type to photo to, you know, a graphic element to how it's arranged on the page. It's, it's all, all the principles are very, very much so the same. They lay down yeah. skeletons. Yeah, and even then though you're not putting the details. Yeah, even even though you're not doing characters and stuff, you're still doing things in a way that's relatable to people, um, which yeah. calls for a lot of very specific thought when it comes to to these topics. Um, mm -hmm. And I I love that you include all of that too, because I think sometimes we also have viewers who maybe aren't, um, maybe they're not illustrators, you know, maybe they're not doing the same kind of work that that you're doing, but like making sure that certain points encompass like different um different professions and different mediums and everything is always very helpful because i think that was one of the things that really was hard for me to realize before is that you can take cues and you can take knowledge and information from different disciplines even if it's mm -hmm. not exactly what you do um you know right. like even just like like learning like you can learn from ui ux designers about like how people think and how people interact with things, you know, and that can also help you with your illustration. You can learn from tons of different areas of expertise where design is concerned to do whatever it is that you are doing specifically. So yeah, sure. also we've yeah. got about two and a half minutes maybe here before we jump oh, yeah, in cool. to, um, to work. So maybe, um, for a, a couple minutes here, um, you can kind of recap um, what you did and then we'll jump into the challenge reviews. Um, and then if we have time after that, you can work a little more or maybe we'll just come back and do another recap for anyone who jumped in new and then um, say goodbye. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. So um, for those of you who have been following along or just joining us, what I did was I started working over this pencil sketch, um, creating this kind of comic book inspired fashion illustration over photography. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did was with this reference sketch utilizing uh, a raster pencil brush in Fresco, I then utilized the vector brush, which you can see here on the left, um, to then start to trace that um, in ways to add a bit more detail, um, to refine some of the elements a bit too, and also to utilize the lasso tool to start to inject a bit of color over that as well to really start to bring this to life. Nice. So if we had like another couple more hours, you'd see me start adding some shading to the jacket, uh, adding the type elements along the top, and then just refining some of the details with some other sort of doodly augmented stuff, which you start to see here with like the arrows, for example, things of that sort to really kind of bring the whole element to life. Yeah. Nice, man. It's looking so good. Um, Thank and you. And then, yeah, now I think I'm going to, I'm going to flip over. I believe you have the discord, correct? Um, I should. Yeah. You said you added it on the group chat as well. Cause I can also just click on that too. Um, yeah, I can, and I can resend it to you if you need it. I'm going to pull it up on my monitor for, um, chat actually. So it'll show up there and then you can follow along and kind of go through there. However you need, um, would you like a, a new link for it? Yes, please. Yes, okay. please. Thank and you. then let me grab it. Um, so say this real quick. Boom. And then I will, I think that um, I had trouble sending it to you in Zoom before. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, pull up uh, the display uh, for 
this real quick. Oops. Um, oh, I see the link here actually from Wade, right? Um, oh yeah, Wade's got it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'm clicking it now. Then I'll just put my last name or so. Continue. And then I am going to make sure I can pull up this uh, thing here. Let me find it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna right, grab a little. I am in. Awesome, and I'm just pulling up the uh, window real quick. I've lost my window, and oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Perfect. So this is the Discord, um, and Wade posted the link um, in the uh, Behance chat. Um, also, another reminder, if you folks are over on YouTube, please come over to behance.net slash live because that is where um, we are reading the chat and uh, talking to everybody and giving feedback and things. So come over to Behance. That's where, you know, anytime we talk about our mods dropping links into the chat, that is where you can get all those resources. Um, uh, so we have the link to the Photoshop uh, Discord in the chat, and when you get there, this is what you will find. Um, we are in the current challenge, hashtag current challenge uh, channel under the feedback um, bracket mm -hmm. here, um, and we've got all of the challenges from today. So I'm going to read the spiel on like what the challenge was today, just for anybody who is unfamiliar and doesn't know. Today, um, the challenge was to improve any photography using basic photo editing and retouching skills. Um, and there's a starter file that you could download. So you could still do this challenge if you want and still turn it in tomorrow or another day um, if you want. Um, and then everybody who has participated um, has put it in here. And this first one, I, I'm i loving this so much. I, you know, I like spooky stuff, but like this is, it looks like from Etta T with this, um, like a really extra large skeleton like laying on the beach. And I just think that is so <laughs> wicked because at first I thought it was like a like regular size, but then I realized like that the skeleton size ratio to the size of those buildings and that wall is like insane. Um, and I don't know why that makes it cooler <laughs> to me, but um, I I think it looks pretty nifty. Do you have any Do you have any um, feedback or anything you might like to to offer for this piece? I see, I see a couple of like skull pieces. I see I see a couple of skull pieces from. There's like a daytime piece and a nighttime piece. That's what I'm oh, noticing nice. as well. So it's like there's a few of them. But I I think it's a lot of fun. I always like stuff where there's a bit of a story element to tell mm -hmm. uh, to it too. So it's like. Because you, you, you can do kind of your compositions in two ways. You can kind of just do something for just aesthetic value and just have initial wow factor. Or you can mm -hmm. have like these sort of narrative pieces that sort of draw you in. And what I get when I look at the skull and like the, the setting and whatnot, it kind of invites me to be curious about a story that's being told. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of akin to what you would get for like gaming concept art and stuff like yeah, that. Like yeah. I can easily see this as well a gaming concept art for like a Bioshock or like a, a Last of Us or um, just any kind of like sort of, for any of you gamers out there, any kind of like post-apocalyptic uh, Those are my favorite experience. games too. Like those are two yeah, great yeah. games you just named. So I, I feel it. All yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. I, I totally get that vibe. Let's see. I'm going to scroll and I'm scrolling down. What I did was I scrolled down all the way in the current challenge tab until I like hit the very bottom and just kind of working my way up towards what, mm -hmm. whatever was posted earlier. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I have yeah. the second one that I'm seeing is the one from IMS4554. Uh, um, and I uh -huh. also love that we got to see, we get to see the original here. Um, so what mm -hmm. he started with and then also um, what the end product was. And I, I always like to point out when I see this because I love it when people do that. Mm -hmm. Always, if you if it's possible when you're submitting for these and we giving we're giving you feedback, I love seeing everybody post the original because it really gives us a good look and insight into the scope of the work you actually did on the project instead of just posting mm -hmm. the final and then I'm just like, well, this is great, but I don't know where you came from, so I don't know how to offer you feedback on what you've done. Um, but this is cool. This is this is great. Um, I think that you've definitely increased like a lot of uh visibility and sharpness on the trees in the back um i would say well i was gonna say that maybe the center of the of the piece you lose a bit of visibility for what the focus point is but i think maybe mm. in the first one it was a little mm. ambiguous as well so um do you have any do you have any yeah. feedback for this one 
Yeah, I would say I like the sort of moodiness of the color. Like the coloration, mm -hmm. I think, is a nice touch. I would, my feedback would be to bring back some of the flaring that overlaps the trees a little bit because mm -hmm. it, it kind of adds like an, an extra layer of gravitas to see the flares kind of come and cut that horizon plane of where the tree line meets the water. Yeah. Um, and for for sake of fun, to add a little bit of a storytelling element, I'd, I'd almost want to add something to the water, like whether it's like a boat on the scene, like a or something that's just like in the water that that's allowing us to discover it somehow to again add that additional storytelling component if that if that was your your aim if that was your direction right if your yeah. sole direction was just to kind of manipulate this photo and kind of give it like a different sort of atmospheric vibe yeah letting those sort of flares kind of come through again uh, over that tree line i think will definitely help make it feel a bit more complete yeah i agree i, I think that's a great um a great suggestion this is great um let's see we've got uh Another one here from Jess, or actually from Ant, my entry for challenge mm -hmm. one, um, with the like mm -hmm. the little skull and big skull in the back. And that is really, really cool. I'm digging mm -hmm. that. I honestly, yeah. I almost didn't even recognize that that was like a big skull in the back until I looked a little bit closer because it's kind of like nestled in with those rocks pretty well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I like it. I think, I think also... Um, Ant, you did a really good job of like throwing that shadow in there next to the rock, the little rock that's laying on the beach to kind of make sure that this feels like it's added into the, um, the, the scene. Um, and mm -hmm. it fits well with the, uh, with the, with the lighting. Um, and even mm -hmm. the lighting like over on the, the larger skull in the background has that nice rim light and that soft hazy vibe to it to show that not only is it lit and it belongs in the scene, but it also has a lot of atmosphere between the camera and that thing off in the distance. And it also feels even more like it belongs. Um, yes. So I'm digging that. Uh, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, I think all the, the sort of the touches, the nuances of how your light source is affecting your environment is 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 really spot on. And I think to push it even further in terms of the drama mm -hmm. um, effect of this is you could even, I mean, you might, you may have a bit of hint of it, but a, a little bit of vignetting in the foreground might add a bit of gravitas to the image as well. Yeah. And then also to help ground that foreground skull that you have on the beach is... Um, Perhaps there's even like some harsher shadowing on, on the face of the skull that's facing us mm -hmm. so that it better sort of grounds it within the context. Because when you have that shadow casted onto the, the sand going towards us, I almost want to see more shadow on that side of the skull as well yeah. to really emphasize that it's actually in that scene. And you can get a lot of like reference for how you might do that because you have all these wonderful rocks in the in the mm. you know the foreground for of this piece and you can see that there are some of the rocks maybe are a little more uh exposed to the light like you have the skull now but with the angle mm. it's at you can see some of the rocks that are like a similar shape and size um mm -hmm. turned at the same angle as the skull they do have like more of a solid black portion of the uh of the shadow on the actual mm -hmm. skull itself as well as that shadow and you might mimic some of that um, yeah. uh, in that. So that's, that's great. Great feedback. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. And then the next one we have is, uh, Jesse and Smith, um, mm -hmm. again with the, I, I don't know why I think it's so cool to have like, like the skull is like so big. <laughs> I just think it's like, it's like, maybe that's like kind of like speaking to like my inner, like fantasy gamer is that it's just cool. I'm just like, this is like a no, giant, yeah. you know, or something. So it could um, even be like a piece of architecture that's like replicating a skull. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Like ancient ruins or something where they serve the deity or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's really cool. One of the things that I really enjoy about about these sort of surreal pieces is again like um, it's like this just element of like mystery or like intrigue about it. It's like why is there like this massive skull in the middle of the ocean? Like what's the story behind it? Like I almost want to see like sequential series of more images that kind of travers through mm -hmm. some of these pieces and like what, what does it look like inside it what's happening inside the skull if I were to go there like what does it look like you know yeah. like it, it, it kind of invites you to to know more of that story um in terms of the the dramatic effect of this it's definitely more dramatic than the previous one in terms of the the, the darkness of the skull mm -hmm. um and it's almost to a point where maybe it went a little too dark I kind of want some of that rim lighting to really be a bit more exaggerated around the around the edge yeah and even let it creep into select portions of the skull a bit just to um 
just to heighten that that level of realism a bit more too, which I think would be quite nice. I like the other additional skeletal bits also to kind of imply that it's a much larger structure than what we're seeing on on screen right now. Yeah, like there's um, there's more to, atmosphere and more area like mm -hmm. that you can't see it, it lets you imagine kind of that suggests more yeah. of the location definitely yeah, exactly exactly um, that yeah, i think yeah. personally i also would like to see because i noticed that a lot of people um i like f using the starter files and stuff using the skull and using this image and everything um mm. a, a lot of people will probably have already put the skull in the water and then i'm sure more people as we get through more um uh, submissions will have as well and i would like to raise the point that it might be interesting for everyone to go back and try making it look more like that water is interacting with this with the skeletal mm. remains because you might yeah. have I, as you can see like it has like all of the like the tide is rolling in so it's obviously it's not still yeah. water it's rolling towards you so you might have like splashing and like water blow back and stuff like yeah. that um kind of around the bones yeah. um in the distance and that might make it look even more uh realistic which is cool um let me see yeah and even like adding little elements for for additional scale too like oh, yeah. um like birds or something like just mm -hmm. to give you a sense of like what what it, how big is this thing actually like some kind of birds human element like like the boat in the in yeah. the first image ant image with the boat i think helps with that sense i of think scale. i think that there is the boat in this one too but i think maybe it was put on a blending mode in the background there mm. um and mm -hmm. i don't know yeah. if that was intentional or not i would say if it's not intentional maybe you accidentally have it on uh set to a wrong blending mode and if it was intentional yeah. i will say i think that what you might want to do instead of turning the opacity down or setting it to a blending mode to add atmosphere is actually add a layer of haze and atmosphere to the actual piece because you want it to be faint maybe since it's in the distance but you don't want it to be transparent because it doesn't do the same thing it doesn't hold the same effect um right. uh, at least at least in my opinion so um maybe maybe check because right. i think yeah. you're very right um curvin in that like having something for scale like birds or the boat or or whatever would be really really great yeah um, absolutely all right let's move on to the next one shall we uh we have one this one here from edda t again i tried using all mm -hmm. of the elements this yeah. is really cool yeah yeah she they add a bit of foreground now too right yeah it's like that blurred component uh on the right um i think that's really really cool and even like i get lost vibes with this i don't know if you ever watched that show lost oh yeah that eyeball oh yeah oh <laughs> like yeah dharma initiative type yeah. vibes happening there it's like like we're on a, a crash site or something yep <laughs> this is um, yeah this is really cool just because it's kind of sh like it shows us like you said like kind of like a whole story going with this mm -hmm. um and i also like that we get to see a little bit more of the uh the skull in the light i could maybe do with a little more shadow underneath but i still think this is really good yeah. and i also it it looks like to me like edda did put what i think is maybe some texture between like where the skull meets the water um that's yeah. what it looks like to me um i would say too. maybe add more of like a like a like a white to it because right now it's very crisp water but when water mm. is in motion as you can see from those waves it gets like that white foamy like kind of spray texture to it um, and I think that having that texture yeah. in the splashing will make it look more realistic because not only will it be more closer to what occurs in real life, but it will also add more of a separation between the skull and the surface of the water. Um, yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, I, th I think it's what's really sweet about this too is um, is uh, is also just the uh, there's something really really nice about that. I don't know if they did they augment how that sun is kind of hitting. Maybe it's the foreground elements, but there's something that's really nice about having that sun hit the sand and then it being sort of blockaded with those foreground elements to create another layer of depth, which yeah. I think was missing in the other ones. Was these foreground elements really add like it's almost like you're you're literally kind of peeking through or like wanting to move things out of the way as you move through the space. Yeah, it's quite I nice. agree. Very nice. Um, well done, Edda T. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then uh, here's a, a Matt, uh, day one, first attempt. And this is cool because we do have like kind of like that vignette kind of um, yeah. thing around the edges here. 
Um, and this is yeah. interesting because this is like same image and everything as the other ones, but it has kind of a darker, um, more uh, right. maybe more sinister vibe to it, which is very interesting. Um, it does, yeah. I think maybe for this one, I would like to see more light on the rocks because mm. the light that's hitting the water and the sand illuminates it quite well. But I feel like when you get to the rocks, it feels more like a border there and less like the light is also interacting naturally with that. Um, and then same mm -hmm. with maybe adding a little shadow to that skull that's laying on the beach. Um, what do you mm -hmm. think, Kerbin? Yeah, I think you're right, because if you look at how the sun is meant to operate, uh, keeping in mind, of course, you know, they're going for something super surreal here, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the sun is, is ultimately a fill light. So, realistically, you would have light kind of bouncing much, much further than what's being implied here. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think is throwing us off with the rocks being so dark, is you kind of want them to have as prominent of, of, of a reaction as, as you see in the water and in the sand. It's like, mm -hmm. it's kind of quite abrupt how it suddenly starts to stop. It almost implies that it's a cliff or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, like it's hidden otherwise from, the sun the, would... from the sun. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So if that's the intent, that's cool. But I, I reckon you would want to otherwise um, let the sun kind of creep onto those rocks a bit more and kind of bring some more of that back even if it's just like peppering in some of the rocks to, to have some shine just to imply that it's still like a surface maybe you're trying to indicate that the rocks texture is a different texture or like a darker texture for example that's not as reflective mm -hmm. you still would have some bounce happening in the foreground I think. yeah i agree i agree but yeah. still very 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 cool um yeah, yeah. so well done uh, and then let me look and see how much time we've got here. We have, um, we can maybe look at a couple more um, before mm -hmm. we uh, start to wrap things up. So this one is from uh, Mahedi, uh, Coastline, mm -hmm. Hi Boss, Paul Tranny. Next we'll uh, give a good tip of Moon and Sun. Awesome, let's check this out. Um, again, this is like also like very interesting and sinister, I think. Um, yeah, that's awesome actually, that's cool. I like how I, they like changed one of it to uh, tonight. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think I think where this one is concerned, um, I love that it has been darkened and turned more to like a nighttime scene. And I also love that the moon is very bright and dramatic in this one. But I think that the highlights on the rocks and the sand and the water would look more believable and more natural if it had the same tone and hue elements as the moon personally um yeah because it's all very yeah, blue exactly. like or or they should have just gone all the way and just make that move yeah. yeah 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 um and maybe a bit of like rim lighting kind of on the on the skull too because i see i think that the colors in the piece overall are really compelling um and i also like it looks like you made everything blue but you also chose not to keep the sails on the boat totally blue which makes it more believable that it's a blue atmosphere and not simply a blue filter over it um but i think you would draw in more of that realism if like because nothing else in the piece except for the light source is that color now um the light source color right. is not really touching right. anything. So I would say, yeah, like mess with, you could do that, you know, adding some of that, that brighter light source to the surrounding clouds to make it believable, adding a bit of rim light to the skull, maybe a little bit of um, glow to the sails of the closest ships because you, they're not, they're not transparent, but they're, they're like very slightly uh, they're not totally opaque, so you might see some of that glow, like, in the sail. Um, and then, yeah, mm -hmm. on the water and the rocks and the sand, kind of giving some more of that white instead of um, only blue. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's what's missing is just that because it's so monochromatic, you, you kind of want just to bring back some of those highlights to indicate some depth. So I would definitely start with the clouds and add some rim lighting around those clouds, like just mm -hmm. airbrushing in some of that white back into the space. Yeah. And then again, again, with the water and, and the sand and the rocks, just a little bit more in, in the boat, just so that, you know, now that you have that nice base blue, it's just bringing back those values to add a bit of depth. It's it, it basically not too different from how you would paint it, honestly. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Adding back those values. 
I agree, yeah. I agree. And I think, too, it's, like, more of a, like, focusing everything, like, in that area over on the right there where you draw, like, the focus of your viewer because I think that the farther you mm-hmm. get back into the distance for one, the more acceptable it is to not put all those highlights because yeah. you don't want to oversaturate it, but just where you're leading the eye, where you're showing people what's going on, have more of that lighting, and I think it will draw people into what you're showing them but also still flow very nicely mm-hmm. into the darkness and so you're adding more light but you're keeping it dark if that makes yeah, sense exactly yeah. so yeah 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 um but very cool. nice uh Mahadi. i appreciate you um throwing that into the discord so we can check it out um this okay so the last one i believe this is the last one that we have time for um from seven Post this and mm-hmm. says, um, I told my mom there was something in that lake. I think that this is so subtle and hilarious and great. Um, there's just the yeah. one tentacle yeah. creeping up from the lake. And that is so good. I feel like that's an excellent note to kind of end on yeah. for these challenges. Because it's like, <laughs> it, it works with the scene so well, but you didn't add tons of stuff. To this to transform the narrative of what I'm looking at mm. um, and I also love that there's so much extra space right. left for the sky and left for the you know the background and then just this tiny little itty bitty change that goes from like serene lake to you really don't want to be in this lake you <laughs> changes it totally um, but yeah well done <laughs> you know what it is it kind of looks like a the, the way it's, the way it's laid out Mm-hmm. It looks like a it looks like a book sleeve or something. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like something you would want to put on like a book, and totally. like uh, like the top allows for like typography and you know things of that sort. Nice. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. Very very well done. And that was from that was from Seven. So thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have now for um, going through uh, some of your entries. So I'm gonna flip back over here and kind of show what uh, everybody. Um, well, what you were working on, show everyone uh, how uh, everything is looking, and maybe you can um, kind of full screen it so we can see the work, and then also tell everybody where they can find you after this. Like, where is the best place they can look up your work online, um, your preferred yeah. social media, and all that. Yeah, sure. So I'm on um, Instagram and Twitter. It's my last name, Brissot. That's B-R-I-S-S-E-A-U-X. Um, I'm especially active on Instagram. So if you have any questions, you want to reach out, say hello, uh, view my workflow, my process, um, feel free to hit me up on there. Other than that, I have a .com, Brissot.com, showing some of my other uh, client work and past projects as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, on Behance, using my last name as well. You could also interact and follow me there too. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, Kervin, uh, it has been an absolute joy and a pleasure being able to host you today and learn from you about um, not only art, but kind of like art, artist life experiences and things. Um, I feel like you've really shed a lot of um, light on a lot of interesting topics. I feel like I, I know a lot more now, and I'm sure chat feels the same way. Um, so thank you for joining me very much. It's, it's been a blast. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun with you, Val, and with you guys as well. Thanks for sharing all the awesome questions, and uh, hopefully we get to do it again soon. Uh, I always enjoy yeah. doing stuff like this, so um, keep in yeah, touch. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really awesome. So um, we do we did start um, everybody in the uh, uh, on the technically like what would have been like the second day um, here. So we will have a different schedule um, planned for tomorrow. So um, Kervin and I won't be back, but um, he did just, as he said, um, list all of his uh, places that you can find him. So please give him a follow. I see Wade just posted your Instagram um, into the chat so people can um, can check that out and see your work and keep tabs on all of your new stuff that's still to come and also look through all of the awesome stuff you've done in the past. Um, and yeah, that's that's all we have for you today, folks. Thank you everyone for, for joining joining us and please stick around for the next segment because we are ending this stream but it is not the end of the adobe live day um so thank you all again thank you Kervin. um and uh until next time you got folks <laughs> adios everyone time. later